So, let's make a start. Phases. So, essentially, a substance can exist as three different sort of phases, okay? We call them phases. Um, the first type is a solid, okay? You next have a liquid. Okay, and you next have a gas. Okay, and there, there'll be, there, are, there is a fourth phase called plasma, but we're not going to cover that today. And so essentially you've got a solid, which is a, you know, an object, we're all aware of this, a liquid, and a gas. And the very common example would be water, because um, that can exist as ice, which is a solid, as water, which is the liquid, and as steam, which is the gas or the vapour. Okay? With a liquid you have this thing called the free surface, which is the distinguishing between the li where the liquid is and where there isn't liquid. <coughs> and so solids, the, you know, they're unique aspects. Obviously, they maintain shape, and they can withstand various different stresses applied to the solid. So when I, you know, if you have a solid or a block of ice, you push it, obviously the block of ice moves. You don't get any sort of shear stress or, or tensile stress. You, um, it, they withstand lots of different types of stresses. They're solid, okay? Whereas fluids, which include liquids and gases, so when we talk about fluids, we're not just talking about liquids, we're talking about both liquids and gases, okay? Um, they tend to take on the shape of their container. So you've got a, a, a jar of, a, of liquid or water, okay? And it, the water will take on the, tape, the shape of the container. If you pour the water out, it takes on the shape of whatever you pour it out onto or into. Okay? Um, and so they, and they also... They've, um, they've, they provide little resistance to sort of permanent change as well. So that's a, the important distinguishing feature of fluids versus solids. Now, there's two types of fluids, as I said. There's um, liquids and, and, uh, and gases, and we tend to refer to these as incompressible flu fluids, okay, which essentially um, are molecules arranged so that a given mass of fluid um, retains virtually the same um, volume irrespective of pressure. So we've got a liquid, essentially. Okay? And so if you had a, if you had a jar of, uh, of liquid and you tried to press down on this jar, um, on the liquid inside the jar, the, the liquid is not going to compress very much at all, if at all, um, unless you get to very, very high pressures, at which point you get a little bit of, um, a little bit of compression, but it's, you know, we're not, we're not going to deal with that right now. The other type is obviously gases and vapours, and these are compressible, which means that essentially if you had that jar full of your gas and you tried to press down on it, you could quite easily press it down, it will compress. And you can get considerable change in um, volumes depending on the pressure that you're applying to that, um, to that gas or vapour. <coughs> and we're going to be dealing with both of these in this course, liquids and vapours, okay, and gases. The first property of fluids is density. Now, some of you may be aware of what density is. Essentially, it's mass per unit volume. So the equation for density looks a bit like this. We've got density which equals rho, which is this uh, Greek letter here. It's not a P, it's a rho, okay? Notice the curly, uh, the curly top. And that's basically the, the quotient of mass divided by volume, okay? So M over big V. M is what we use to, determine, to represent mass, and big V is what we use to <coughs> represent volume, okay, capital V. And uh, the density of water, common substance, happens to be 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed, okay, so that's quite an easy, easy uh, one to remember, okay. Now, you may come across, in your notes, you may come across something called relative density, okay. Now, relative density, um, we'll try to avoid using it, but like I said, it may be in your notes already, is essentially the density of a substance with respect to water, okay? So if I've got a... Um, and to calculate it, you basically you multiply the relative density by the density of water, and that will give you the density of the substance. So if I say to you, we've got a relative density of 13.6, okay, or mercury has a relative density of 13.6, that means that the actual density of mercury is 13.6 multiplied by 1,000, okay? <coughs> So the, the, the density of mercury is 13,600, okay? So that's something worth remembering, because like I said, you may come across it in your notes and in the questions, okay? So pressure, the next subject. We've got a, uh, a closed cylinder here. We've got a piston, and there is a, we've got a, a gas or a fluid of some description inside that piston. Okay, and when we apply a force to the end of the piston, 
obviously it's going to try and compress what's in that uh, piston. Okay? And the area of the piston we've determined is A. Okay? So the pressure is the force exerted per unit area. Okay? So what does that mean? Well, essentially, neglecting the weight of the fluid, we've got this equation. Pressure is force divided by area. So you've got so much force being applied over a specific area, and that is the pressure. Okay? Now, force is obviously measured in newtons. Area is measured in square meters. Okay? And so we end up with the units of pressure being newtons per meter squared. And they're also known as Pascal. And they're the same, they're the same thing. One newton per meter squared is one Pascal. You may have heard of Pascals before. The other <coughs> units that we use for pressure, and we'll come on to them more next semester, perhaps, and you'll definitely cover them in thermo next semester, is bar. Okay? Now, one bar is essentially 10 to the 5 newtons per meter squared. So you've got 10,000, or no, 100,000 even, newtons per meter squared is one bar. Okay? Are there any questions so far? No? That's good. Okay. So pressure in a fluid. At rest, say we've got a container. It's got a gas inside it. Okay. Now, the, assuming that, that that gas is under some sort of pressure, basically the pressure of that gas acts in every direction at all times. Okay. So it, and wh when you get to a surface, it acts normally to the surface. But say you've got a surface inside there, um, the gas is acting on both sides of that surface at all times, okay? It acts equally in all directions. <clears throat> and, like I said, on a surface, it's normal to the surface, so 90 degrees, or perpendicular to that surface. And at any two points in the same horizontal plane, the pressure is equal. How do we try and determine what the pressure is of something, okay? <coughs> well, let's assume we've got a column of liquid... Okay, and um, we'll call this column, uh, well, this liquid is held in a vessel, okay, and the height of the liquid from the bottom of the vessel is what we determine as HP. Now, we'll cover what HP stands for, but basically it's the height, okay. Now, the vessel has a constant cross-sectional area, so the area at the top is the same as the, the area at the bottom, okay, and obviously the, the liquid or the vessel that's in, the, or, the, or the fluid that's in that vessel is applying a downward force obviously due to gravity, okay? And it's applying a force to the bottom of this vessel. And so how do we work out what the, uh, what the pressure is on the base of this vessel or on the bottom of the liquid, okay? Well, firstly, we determine what the volume of the liquid is, okay? Now, obviously, we've got the cross-sectional area, that's A, and we've got the height of the liquid, so that's H, and so A times H is obviously the volume in metres cubed, Yeah? Now, the mass of the liquid, well, um, we know that we've got the density. We've just worked that out beforehand. And the density multiplied by the volume will give us the mass. You've got volume, which is in metres cubed, and density, which is kilograms per metres cubed. So the metres cubed cancel, you end up with um, the mass of the liquid. Okay? The weight of the liquid, well, we essentially apply Newton's second law. You will, you'll cover that in more details in dynamics next semester. But Newton's second law essentially says the force that is being created um, is the mass times acceleration, okay? Now, obviously, we're dealing with weight, which is a force, and so it's mass times acceleration, and obviously G is the acceleration, that's gravity. Okay, so you've got the weight of the liquid, which is um, mass times uh, the gravity, so we've got rho, A, H, G, okay? And then, obviously, the pressure on the base is the force divided by the area. And so we've got the force, which is the weight, divided by the area, which is A, and so you've got rho A H G divided by A. Obviously, the A's will cancel, and you end up with the pressure in the liquid due to the weight of the fluid above is rho G H, okay? Now, you want to remember this equation. It's quite useful. And this is known as the hydrostatic equation, okay? And H P, I said H is the height. The other word for, the other um, way this is used is called the pressure head, Okay, which is measured in metres. And so if, if something says it's got a head of <coughs> how many metres, that's, that's this HP value. Okay? And so you can plug it into the equation <coughs> with the right value for density and you get the pressure. Okay? So what about atmospheric pressure? I talked a little bit about it. Well, let's imagine we've got a, a column of air okay, from from the ground surface all the way up to where air ends in, the, in space. 
Okay, and it's one meter squared in in uh, in area. Okay, so we've got one meter squared of air column of air, and its weight on average has been determined to be around 101,300 newtons. Okay, and so we've got the force, the weight, we've got the air, uh, sorry, the area. Okay, and so obviously the force divided by the area will give us the pressure, and obviously we. So 101,300 newtons divided by 1 is obviously 101,300. And so the pressure of the atmosphere at ground at sea level is 101,300 newtons per meter squared. Okay? Obviously, kilonewtons per meter squared, you just divide that by 1,000, you get 101.3 kilonewtons <coughs> per meter squared. And to get it in bar, we take out 10 to the 5, and you get 1.013 bar. Now, obviously, you can see that that's very close to 1 bar. Okay, so atmospheric pressure is approximately one bar. Now, absolute and gauge pressure. There's two ways we can measure pressure. Okay, there's atmospheric, uh, sorry, absolute pressure, and gauge pressure. If you've got a container that's completely empty, so there's a vacuum inside. Okay, the absolute pressure inside that container is zero. Okay. Now, the gauge pressure includes atmospheric pressure. So, say we had a, a you know, I've got my box here. Okay, I put a lid on it right now. The pressure in there, with my, with my gauge, I measure zero. But we all know that inside that box is atmospheric pressure because I haven't, I haven't <coughs> emptied it. Okay, I put the lid on it, and it's atmospheric pressure inside the box. But if I plug a gauge into that, it's zero. Okay, so there's two different ty types of uh, measurements. Okay, there's absolute and gauge. And so, as I said, absolute pressure. If you've got a vessel that's completely empty, the pressure inside a vacuum is zero. Okay. <coughs> but gauge pressure is when it's subject to the atmospheric pressure. And so it only indicates pressures that differ from atmospheric pressure. So say I put the lid on this and then I injected some more fluid into there. The pressure would increase, okay? And so my gauge would start to show an increase in pressure. And conversely, if I put the lid on this, took some of the fluid out, obviously the pressure would decrease. And so again, my gauge would show a decrease in pressure, okay? So it shows positive and negative pressures, okay? Um, but that is those that differ from atmospheric pressure. Okay? So atmospheric pressure is zero gauge pressure. We've, that's what I've said before. And then absolute pressure is the gauge pressure plus the atmospheric pressure. Okay? And so zero absolute pressure means we've got a very large negative gauge pressure that, that cancels out the at, um, atmospheric pressure. Okay? And we assume, in your problems and, and on the exam and stuff, we assume that we're, just, we're talking about absolute pressure unless we state otherwise, okay? So if we state something is specifically gauge pressure, then you've got to bear that in mind when you're doing your calculations. Okay. 